Lakeland PBS, the Bemidji Pioneer, Brainerd Dispatch, Park Rapids Enterprise, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2022, a look at our area legislative candidates. Your moderator tonight is Bethany Wesley. And now the Senate District 5 debate. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us live at the Lakeland PBS studio in Bemidji for Debate Night 2022. I'm Bethany Wesley, your moderator for tonight and tomorrow. We look forward to an exciting week of debates covering topics and issues that are important to you and your communities. Tonight, we get started with Senate District 5. Our candidates are Senator Paul Utke, Republican Party, and A. John Peters, Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Our panelists today are Dennis Wyman, Lakeland PBS News Director, Heidi Holton, National Public Radio Affiliate, KAXE News Director, and Shannon Geisen, Park Rapids Enterprise Editor. Our rules for tonight's debate. Opening comments, each candidate will have three minutes for opening comments. The panel will then ask questions. Some will be their own questions, others may come from the public. The candidates will rotate the order they speak, beginning with opening comments and finishing with closing comments. Each candidate gets two minutes for each question. Each candidate will also have a one minute rebuttal opportunity. Candidates will have the option of using one minute of bonus time to add to one of their answers tonight. This can be used during the answer to the initial question or during the rebuttal, but can only be used once. Questions will continue until we're about 50 minutes into the debate, and then we'll move on to closing comments. Closing comments are two minutes. We're gonna go ahead and get started with opening comments. Paul, you're first. Thank you. And uh, I will just uh, introduce myself a little bit to our viewers tonight. Um, I am Paul Etke. Uh, my wife and I have lived in Park Rapids for the past 29 years. Uh, we have two adult daughters one living in Fargo, North Dakota, and the other in Atlanta. A um, little of my history is uh, I'm originally from North Dakota, grew up there just southwest of Fargo. My work career is uh, consisted of uh, 15 years with Mack truck dealers, 16 years we've been, uh, we owned and operated a retail hardware and equipment rental store in Park Rapids. Um, since then, I've been involved in the insurance industry. I've been a licensed insurance agent for 12 years and a certified legal videographer for 15 years. Uh, <clears throat> my government career, um, as far as being a, in the elected offices, consists of seven years with the Park Rapids City Council and now six years uh, serving in the Minnesota Senate. Um, in the Minnesota Senate, currently I chair the uh, Health and Human Services Committee. I also serve on our Human Services Reform Committee, uh, our Energy and Utilities Committee, along with our Jobs and Economic Growth. Um, I'm proud of what Senate Republicans have uh, done for Minnesota the last number of years, and I'm, you know, have been happy and proud to be amongst uh, the leadership of our caucus. We have shown with our votes that we support public safety, uh, school choice, we support tax relief for all Minnesotans, and we support our people in need. Um, there's, of course, a lot more work to do, and that's uh, why I'm running for another term and asking for your vote. Um, when we finished the 2022 legislative session this past spring, we had a number of important items on our agenda, which we did pass off the uh, Senate floor, but of course, uh, as we all know, uh, not a lot of them made it across the finish line when they hit the house. So um, that again leaves us uh, a lot of work to do as we look forward to our next session. And uh, you know, priorities remain the same. Uh, public safety, economy, our state surplus. Um, we've got some education um, issues that are at the top of our list. And then uh, of course, uh, we all know what our long-term uh, care providers, disability providers, PCAs, et cetera, have uh, experienced over the last uh, couple years with their COVID. So um, with that, I look forward to what the rest of the evening brings forward and uh, thank you. Thanks, Paul. John, opening statement? Yeah, I'm John Peters. I live in Browerville, Minnesota. I run a business in Long Prairie, Minnesota. Just to let you know, I've retired twice and I can't handle retirement at all. And I don't think my wife can handle me being retired either. But 
I grew up in Shelby, Iowa, a town of 533 people. My folks ran a grocery store in town. When I was growing up, I mowed lawns, shelled corn, <coughs> dug graves, weeded beans, baled hay, and delivered groceries for my parents. Now, one of the things that I believe in that I was taught growing up in the rural communities that I did is that you have to have an ethic of hard work and you have to have people that are willing to work together. My parents, when they ran the grocery store, at the beginning of the farming season, they would let the farmers pay credit all the way through harvest and did not charge a single extra cent. That's putting the farmers ahead, knowing when people are in need. On top of it, when the farmers paid, they gave each of the kids a full-size candy bar. And back then, a full-size candy bar was full size. So th that's what it is. So we believe in putting people first. The other thing is, my parents gave the Christmas tree to each of the churches. They gave the candy and the fruit to each of the churches for their Christmas programs. So that's putting people first. That's what I believe in. So after I went to school, I managed to go to college. Uh, basically, I was not a great college student because I was very immature at the time. And I majored in beer, girls, and football, not necessarily in that order. But as I grew older, I found out that you need to really buckle down and concentrate on what you are doing. During, I managed to graduate from college with a degree in mathematics, uh, with minors in philosophy, coaching, and physics. So I have that type of background. When I was in college, I was also an intern for the moon landing on there. Uh, I basically didn't do very much other than uh, bring the food to the programmers, but it still got to be with that. And then as we go along, I've been an educator in both high school and college. I have been a uh, scientist, I've been a mathematician, and I've worked through that. During this next time, I'm going to be working for the people. And also, as Paul said, there are things that didn't get across the going line. Our side will say that it was the Senate that stopped it as compared to what he said. But th that's what we want to do, is we want to get stuff across the goal line. And I'm looking forward to serving you in this district. Thank you. Thanks, John. We're going to move into our questions from our panelists. So our first question will come from Dennis Wyman. John, you'll have the first answer. Okay. All right, thanks Bethany, and thank you both for joining us again th this evening. It's a very good service to voters to hear from both candidates in a forum like this. My question is in regards to the budget surplus, another large budget surplus this year. What do you think that money should be spent on, and can you be as specific as possible? And do you consider our state income tax rate too high? Okay, uh, the income tax rate is too high for people earning less than $400,000 a year. It is too low for people that are earning more than $400,000 a year and for corporations. Now there's this myth out there on that, that if we raise our taxes, corporations go away. Uh, me being a scientist, I've looked at the numbers, the same number of companies come in as go out during any given year. Now, as far as our budget surplus, we need to put more money into education, first of all. With that, what we need to really do is make sure that we have counselors and that we have, uh, for both psychological and mental health and for just career things. We do not have enough counselors in our high schools. The second thing is money we need to put more money into the broadband. As part of the Todd County Broadband Coalition, we're trying to bring fiber to every home in Todd County, and we really need to get broadband out to there so we can remain competitive in the rural districts. So that's, that's where I'm going to be saying the top two things on here. Uh, Paul mentioned the fact that our nursing homes, my wife is a nurse at a nursing home. They lost about half of their people to COVID on there. And the nurses are burnt out. The nurses are burnt out and we need to help them get to where they want to go. The last thing is public health, where our farmers uh, have one of the highest suicide rates of any industry, and we need to work to get enough mental counseling for those people. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul? 
Thank you. Um, and I'll just take the, the two items in order here. Um, the surplus, uh, we, we, we had a lot of different discussions on that this last year. We still anticipate having a sizable surplus. You know, the one thing we've all discussed is, you know, what's this last six months done as far as the, with the inflation and the economy, the way it's going, although the revenue collections seem to be holding strong. So we do anticipate, I guess, or from what I see, I guess I would anticipate having uh, a sizable um, surplus when we get back. Number one is tax relief. Um, we've got to reduce our overall uh, tax rates. And with that, uh, you asked about, is our income tax too high? Yes. Our lowest rate is 5.35, which is higher than a lot of the state's highest rate. Um, and then, of course, we go up almost just under 10, 9.85, I believe, on our highest rate. Uh, we are overtaxed. Uh, we can do better, and uh, we look to uh, reduce that. Okay. John, you have an opportunity for a one-minute rebuttal? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, what we have to think about when we're talking about tax rates is the total amount of money that comes out of your pockets. What I am saying here is I've lived in states that had a lot lower tax rates, Iowa, Nebraska, but they have higher property tax rates. For us in rural Minnesota, property tax hurts more than income tax. So what we have to do is balance that out. We have to lower our property tax, and that's the only way we can do that is to keep our tax rate about where it's at for the regular stuff so we can not force the townships to go in debt every year. Thank you. Okay. Paul Rebuttal? Yeah, I guess I would just follow up with the fact that uh, I, st I still believe we're, we're taxed too much. Um, I look at what we're spending um, at a state level, uh, just short of $52 billion for this last biennium. We're spending plenty of money. We're spending too much money. We've got a way that we can cover all our obligations and then some with what we've got. Uh, we just need to... Uh, uh, spend smarter, so to speak, and that will allow us to control our tax rates and uh, still take care of all our obligations across the state. All right, thank you. We're going to move to our second question. So our next question will come from Heidi Holton. Paul, you'll have first answer. Thanks to Lakeland for including me in tonight's proceedings. The Associated Press recently reported that ACT college admission tests this year have hit their lowest point in more than 30 years, evidence of the learning disruption of the global pandemic. What specifically do school districts in your region need? Paul, you'll be first. I would say it's an extension of what we spent a fair amount of time working on this past uh, session, which ended up being early, um, you know, and from the end of January through May of 2020, when I refer to our current session. But um, we realize and know that uh, COVID um, really hurt our schools. Our kids suffered greatly. And so we were putting an emphasis on our early learners with this last session um, in trying to get them, basically let them hopefully get caught up is the biggest thing. that We always say you, you learn to read on, through third grade and then you read to learn thereafter. Well, across all of our age levels, uh, they suffered because we had um, a lot of distant learning, which we have found out a lot of kids did not participate in or got very little out of. Um, so we've got catch up to do across the board and you know, our local school districts are seeing that. Um, but again, we know that we've got to go back to those young learners because if they start out that far behind, um, they're going to struggle all the way through their school age, uh, school years and uh, that's just not acceptable. That'll lead to even lower ACTs and it's not surprising the ACTs were re reduced just because kids weren't getting the hours in the classroom that they would normally have had uh, prior to uh, the spring of 2020. Thanks, Paul. John. Uh, yeah, the ACT scores and the SAT scores have been dropping consistently for the last 30 years in there. So, uh, and I agree with Paul that COVID really hurt our children this year. Uh, I've always maintained the fact that we have really messed with our teachers. We throw them into a high, into an online system, 
And on top of that, when we did that, they had no training because almost half of our teachers don't know how to use a computer. So how could they teach online? Now, I personally thought that we should have gone to a hybrid situation where we took half the students in the morning so we could socially distance, did hybrid for the rest of it, and then the same thing. Now, the other, other thing is that was really important for the younger learners because the mask. The mask was causing problems for younger learners because they relate through the face of the teacher. So they did not work well in the situation that we had, and we need to work with that. I also believe that we need to start increasing the amount of early childhood education on there, plus the fact we also need to make sure that we have good child care because a lot of parents have to work. That really goofed up the time at school with their children because if you have to work, you cannot help them with their homework. And so we have to figure out ways to work our way through that. I don't think we've successfully done that yet, but I hope we can in the future because we will have other situations in which we'll have some kind of epidemic or pandemic on here. So these are things that we weren't prepared for, and I hope we can prepare for it better in the future. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul, rebuttal? I guess it would just be an addition. Um, you know, this just points out the fact that it was mentioned that, you know, our teachers weren't prepared. I mean, they're, they're, all along, they're prepared to show up in a classroom and teach the students in person. Um, all of a sudden, becoming a teacher over the internet I, was a challenge for all of us and particularly I'm sure for them uh, we all got to uh, live in a world of zoom and uh, every other um, platform that we could use and we, we were all learning but it also points out the the shortage of broadband we happen to be sitting in kind of one of the best areas of the state here in Bemidji um, they're well served with uh, Paul Bunyan and uh, going to the uh, west with Garden Valley but a lot of our rural areas really suffered. So if you don't have broadband, they weren't able to hook up to the school. Um, that just added to that complication and uh, that's what they suffered through. Thanks, Paul. John, rebuttal? Well, it's not really a rebuttal. Uh, again, I'm a big believer in broadband. I thought it was really sad that the, we saw students in the McDonald's and the high school parking lots and the Coburn parking lots having to do their homework in the winter. That was really not very good to have happen on there. Uh, I've taught uh, what I call hybrid classes. I've written online classes when I was teaching in college. For me to use an in-class classroom would take me about a month to get ready to do an online class. It would take me about six months. So yes, we do need work on that area to train the teachers because this will happen again. We need the broadband and we need help for the teachers Totally. Thank you. Thanks, John. We're going to move to our third question. So, Shannon. I would also like to thank Paul ben Lakeland PBS for including me and the Park Rapids Enterprise tonight. Do you believe we have free and fair elections in the U.S. and in Minnesota? And will you accept the results of the November 2022 election? John, that's your answer first. Yes, I know. Oh, okay. I find that I don't know whether we as Democrats should be uh, proud of the fact that they think we were that organized to do this type of major stuff. I believe in Minnesota there was what, 3,300,000 mil votes and we found 17 bad votes in there. So yes, I do believe that we've had free, fair elections on there. I don't believe that Democrats could organize a problem like that. I do believe that, oh, that the people uh, that believe that we have unfair elections that have been duped, the people that don't believe it but are still saying it are traitors. I'll repeat that. People that believe that we had fair elections but they won't admit that they're fair elections, they're traitors to our country because they are upsetting free and fair elections. We need to get everybody to vote. Thank you. That's all I need to say. Thanks, John. Paul? You know, it's, it's something that has, the, the sad part of all of this is there are people who are concerned and have questions about our voting. Um, that's the bad part, because we should be at a point where we don't even have to question what's going on. Um, you know, we, we, 
we see a lot of things that supposedly weren't right, uh, but we are a, a nation of laws, a state of laws, where if things like that actually did take place, we've got a, a judicial system that they can bring things forward and uh, take them through the court of law and prove their point, and we would find out if there was actually a problem or not. You know, so that's, it's, it, that's up in the air. I'm not uh, taking sides there. But the one thing we have, in the six years I've been in the legislation, we have really worked to what I would call shore up our elections. Let's even make them better. Um, we could add voter ID. We could add provisional ballots. Um, there's concerns with the mail-in ballots and concerns with the same-day registrations. There is challenges and legitimate concerns, but yet when we bring those things up and have tried to have the conversations, we've had them in bills that, to me, okay, let's just make it even better, make sure people are comfortable with um, the, the elections we have. We do find opposition, real strong opposition. It fights us right to, tooth and nail to the end, and so far nothing has been added. Um, so that's the part that you could say, is there a concern? Well, from the other side, why are they fighting us so much to put more guardrails around the election if there is not a problem. So with that, I know this conversation will continue and uh, we'll see where it lands. But uh, uh, you know, we're a modern nation. We, I think we can do better. Thanks, Paul. John, rebuttal? Okay, voter IDs would be okay if they're free. We triple the number of places to get them. We allow the fact that there are not hard, that they're very hard to reproduce, and we train the election judges to do that. To me, that looks like it's about a $2 million job for the state of Minnesota to do that. So I'm, that's, if you can do that with that, that they're free, that we can get them to the senior citizens, that we can get them to the college so we don't wrap up the uh, time on their side, we, need, we can do that. I love absentee voting. I love early registration. During the COVID years, I did not want to go into the office, and now uh, the only way I'll ever vote is either at the uh, early or at, uh, through the mail. So I don't see any problem, because last time I did that with okay. the uh, system, John, I actually I had to, I, no, yep. just let me finish, I had to, sign in that the person that was voting absentee was that, so they could check both of us. I see no problem with it. Sorry for going along. It's okay. Paul, rebuttal? I'll just uh, tie a couple loose ends together. When I say, or when we talk about mail-in ballots, uh, we have an issue with that, but that doesn't include the absentee, which it actually could get mailed to you. The absentee ballot is a good deal uh, because not everybody can show up on election day to vote. We fully support and want everybody to be able to vote. Um, we just want to make sure that there's no questions. And so um, well, I do like the absentee, so thank you. Thank you. We'll move to our fourth question. So that's from Dennis. Okay, and we're gonna go with a viewer question from Hubbard County. Uh, Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center has been instrumental in learning about aquatic invasive species prevention and management. This viewer writes, they have been leaders in looking ahead through research strategies on how do we can protect our lakes for present and future generations. The viewer would like to know, do you support long-term funding for MAISRC and their research work on aquatic invasive species to protect one of Minnesota's greatest assets, our lakes? Paul? Um, hi, thank you. And yes, I guess I support the funding. I also wanna make sure uh, and I've asked this question already in the years that I had the chance down in St. Paul, is it's one thing to continue the funding for the prevention, but we know that at some point something always sneaks through. So at the same time, it's not only, it's like in everything, you've got the prevention side, but then we've got to have the proactive side. What are we doing to be able to treat the waters and do what we need to do if they do get infected. And so I think we need to do it, it has to be an all of the above approach, approach because uh, you know we'll do the best we can to s save the problem, but we also need to be proactive and working that, you know, 
our lakes are, I mean, they're huge up here. That's why people come to northern Minnesota, or one of the big reasons. Uh, come up here and recreate on our beautiful lakes, uh, enjoy the woods, uh, everything else that goes with it. And, you know, it's, it's something that the area people have taken care of and done a wonderful job over this time and centuries before us. Uh, we just want to make sure that we maintain that and uh, do everything we keep, can to keep them up going forward. And so people can continue to come north and enjoy um, the water and spend time in our communities. Thanks, Paul. John? Well, yeah, I definitely support it. I've been in contact with some of the lake associations up here, uh, not as much as I should, but more than I, uh, more than absolutely zero. They're doing a wonderful job maintaining their lakes. <coughs> yes, we need to protect our lakes, and yes, we need to do uh, measures after we do this, which I believe the University of Minnesota uh, and Bemidji State are doing some of that work right now. What I've seen with the milfoil, uh, the prevent the mitigation problems uh, are actually causing more problems. So we need some more scientific research when we get into this type of stuff to figure out what actually works on there. Uh, now, I always say that uh, water is more important than oil. There are people that actually want to dig a ditch from Lake Superior or the Mississippi River down to the Colorado River and that's going to cause us all kinds of problems. And our fresh water is very important to us. We need to protect our water. We need to make sure that the water, uh, when, it, when it starts having a problem, that we reduce it to the minimum possible. And that's really what we need to do. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul, rebuttal? Uh, no. OK. All right, next question comes from Heidi. What is your position when it comes to electric vehicles? As a state senator, will you support this industry and its infrastructure? Why or why not? Okay, uh, I've seen a lot of stuff lately of bashing um, the batteries for electric things. And what I'd like to do first of all is kind of give a little allegory here. Remember what our phones were like 30 years ago? I know the young people here don't. But they all had tails. Do you remember what it, they had? They had tails. They were connected to the wall. So what, what do we have to do is we've looked at our technology. In 2002, how did you use your phone? How far have cell phones come from 2002 to today? How far have they come from 2010 to today? How far have they come since 2018 until today? Our problems with electric vehicles are basically the batteries and the solar collection. Now, I've been studying this. I'm a scientist. I, I'm sorry, I'm a nerd. But there are at least 10 different new batteries that are going to be coming out in the next five years. One of them will be a covering flex that's clear and possibly last for about 11 years, which is the life of the car. So you could actually be charging your car while you're driving during the day. There are other ones in which they get rid of the need for lithium, so we're using sodium. So we need to work and trust our industry to quit to the electric vehicles because 2000, 2035 is a long way away and it, that means that we are going to have to use this. And one of the things that's going to be important is to get the industries that help that up to our district. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul? Thank you. Um, electric vehicles, first of all, we're not a California too, and I am <laughs> as strongly opposed to that as possible. But when it comes to the electric vehicles, I say let the industry take care of that. I already know, and I've had conversations with um, representatives of General Motors and Ford, et cetera, where they are investing heavily in the electric vehicles. So let the industry go out there, do the research. If they want to build the vehicles, which they have and they will continue, but then they will sell that to the population. They'll come out and tell us why we should drive a vehicle, electric vehicle, or what our options would be. From my point of view, government should not be in the middle of this mandating a single thing. Um, just let the industry do it because not only is it the 
electric vehicle that's going to come out and gonna, they're going to have to entice us to buy. But our electrical grid couldn't handle a big influx of additional demand. Um, we already are at a point where it's, it's marginal. Um, and we've got to make sure that, and it goes back to lead, manufacturers on the electrical vehicle side and the industry on the electrical the delivery side, that we have capacity for all of the above and let it grow at a, a reasonable pace so that we can keep up um, and that we are not having brownouts and blackouts just due to some mandated regulation. Um, I, it's, it's a thing of the future. I'm sure we're going to see it. Um, but let it take its time. Thanks, Paul. John, you have a rebuttal? Yes, I do. Uh, first of all, I'm a big supporter of the new nuclear energy uh, out in uh, Wyoming. Uh, they are building a plant that uh, could actually up here create 2,000 jobs. It uses a, a fluid in which uh, it is five times safer than water, and it is firmer, and it actually uses some of the spent, spent rods from our Edu from our uh, other plants. The second thing is, why don't we subsidize renewable energy as much as we do the oil companies? Okay? That's all I'm saying. If, if what's good for the goose is good for the gander, I know it'll kill the economy if we stop subsidizing our oil, but we can also help by subsidizing our renewables. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul? I think I pretty well covered it all. It's just that uh, keeping everything in perspective because I think the thing we all, uh, when we go home or no matter where we're at and we flip that light switch, we want our lights to come on and we want a reliable source and we want an affordable source. And that's really the biggest thing with our energy. And uh, so it's balancing that with the um, influx and the addition of an electric vehicle. All right. Thank you. Shannon? The overturning of Roe v. Wade by the U.S. Supreme Court has put abortion law back in the hands of state legislatures. Do you support any specific changes to state law? Um, you know what? Because in Minnesota, um, we have got Doe v. Gomez, which was a Supreme Court ruling back in 1995. It really has taken everything out of the hands of the legislature. We do not have, I mean, we could write all the laws we want. We could even pass them. And if we had a governor that would sign them, they're going to go right to the Supreme Court. The only way that anything's going to change in Minnesota is, there's actually two ways, but one would be if there was language that could go up and challenge the court and get the court to first look at it and then why would it be different and get them to rule on it and you know that's where it's going to have to be overturned if it's going to happen in Minnesota. The other is there could be a constitutional amendment. But as much chatter as there's going on this election season over that topic, nothing's going to happen in Minnesota because we can't, we can't write legislation and pass it and change anything. Thanks, Paul. John? <clears throat> OK. Uh... I'm just going to give my personal point of view here. I cannot talk about this as emotionally as some of the other people can. But I believe that we need to reduce the need and the want for abortions. What do I mean by that? We need to make sure that our women are supported before, during, and after pregnancy, both financially, emotionally, both financially and emotionally. I'm going to give a little note here. <coughs> Places that have laws against abortion have more reported abortions than the places that have liberal abortion laws. Again, you are having more abortions when you make it illegal. So what happens here is in the Netherlands, health care is completely free. They love their health care in the Netherlands, okay? Abortions are free. Birth control is free. They have half the number of abortions per thousand that the USA does. Half. They also have a lower 
age of consent than the USA, USA does, but on average, the USA has youth kids starting sex at a younger age. So what we have to do is make sure that we work ourselves through that we may take away the need for abortions. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul, rebuttal? No. Okay. All right, next question is from Dennis. How would you approach economic development for small business owners? And what, as a state legislature, would you do to help the small business owners who are facing challenges these days? Okay, so, uh, like Paul, for the small business owner, I'm a small business owner. I've been running my own business since 1989. I would like to see less paperwork. I would like to see ways in which I could reduce my taxes. I would like to make sure that I have all the tools that I need, including broadband, so I can work where I want. That's what the legislature can do to us. It can also help us revitalize our downtowns in rural Minnesota. On there, that means getting things ready, but making sure that the buildings and the roads are good without raising property tax. That's what we have to do in rural Minnesota. Reduce the paperwork, and a small farmer is a, re, is a uh, small business person too. And we need to work our way through that type of information, reduce their taxes, remove their property taxes, a total out of pocket, and make less paperwork. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul? Yeah, and I would, my part on something like that is, uh, small business is not looking for a handout, but I think they're looking for government to let them just do their job. And part of that is our regulatory system. Um, you know, it's very burdensome in most areas and heavily burdensome in a lot of areas. Um, that along with our tax structure. Uh, government is there to supply a good infrastructure and, you know, assist where needed. But uh, we've got to get to the point where we allow small business to be creative. That's what's you know, you look at how many businesses we all know that started in someone's garage and as a hobby and they grow into a small business and then they become a large business. But we need to be there at, at the state level to be their partner, to assist them. Uh, when they need help, how can we help? But first of all, we need to get out of their way. And, um, you know, we all want regulation of some sort because we want to maintain what we've got if we're an environment and the water and everything else that we've got around us. And nobody's here to abuse that. But we go overboard in so many cases. And so a big part of that would be just allowing that business to move forward and not have, have government um, tied, basically uh, tied to them and holding them back. Um, let's, uh, let's help them move them forward and then uh, if they make a few bucks, hopefully they can keep more of it so that as a small business, um, what do we all do? We reinvest in what we've got. We want it to get bigger. Um, so uh, the more they can keep, the more they're going to invest, the bigger they're going to get, the more people they're going to hire, the more good they're going to do. So uh, that's what I, what I would like to be there to help them with. Thanks, Paul. John, rebuttal? Just a little bit to add to that. There are some regulations that actually reduce the long-term cost of stuff like building codes, electrical codes, things like that. And uh, pretty much, I agree, but keep, the, keep the government out of our way. But like for the farmers, we need to make sure that the disaster relief gets there without a lot of the problems that we've had with the paperwork. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul? No. Okay. Next question comes from Heidi. We'll stay with the topic of small business and employers. Many employers are trying to entice workers right now, but there are issues that they can't control. High cost or lack of daycare as well as lack of affordable housing. What can be done with these issues and what are you hearing from people that you've met on the campaign trail? It, it's for this, any type of a business, small business owner all the way up to the big ones, uh, small business owner, you're the one that's on the front lines with your customer to hiring the employees, taking care of them. Uh, you've got the, the whole gamut. Um, at the bigger levels, you've got the HR people, et cetera, but they all have the same issue, and that's being able to hire 
the right talent, and then being able to keep them. Um, and, you know, it's part of it uh, is going to be kind of, we have to recreate ourselves. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations in the last number of months. Actually, we had them back in the last session too, but I've had more this summer and this fall. Um, the employers are going to have to think outside the box, so to speak. How are we going to build that employee base? Do we do it with a couple retirees that only want to work a couple days a week? Replace that 40 hour person that we'd love to have. Now we're going to have two or three people filling it. Or what are we going to offer for benefits that's going to make us stand out to the other businesses that are also competing for this employee? Um, I've been involved in uh, some of this stuff across the country, um, working with the uh, paid family medical leave part of it, um, putting it into the private sector so it'll be purchased as a uh, insurance policy so that the employer may have that as another option. Nothing mandated from the federal government. Um, if you decided that that's a benefit to you, you can uh, buy that. Uh, it will be coming through a life insurance agent when it finally comes to Minnesota, and that's what we're working on across all 50 states. And, but that's just one piece of many that we're going to have to do things differently. Um, daycare, you mentioned, daycare has been huge. That Even long before COVID, daycare was what we always said was our number one economic driver. If we had enough daycare, our business could, could do that much more work. And uh, so uh, that's only become uh, a bigger and more important piece. Thanks, Paul. John? Okay, um, we've got a kind of a situation here that's a catch-22, and for those of you that are old enough, that's catch-22, know what catch-22 is, is uh, came from a book in the service. If you uh, wanted to get out of the service, you had to be insane. If you wanted to say you were insane, you couldn't get out of the service. That's a catch-22. What we have here is, one, we have the lowest employment rate in the history of the state of Minnesota. What is it, around 2% or 1.5%? So we don't have enough workers that really want, have, can work right now. Two, we can't get a lot of the young parents to work because they need the daycare and they can't afford it. But the thing that I'm seeing down in my area is housing. We do not have enough housing. We do not have enough affordable housing. Most of the young workers cannot afford a $2 million home. I can't afford a $2 million home. So what we need to do is get more inexpensive homes so our employers can bring the employees in so we can hire new people. So that's how we get work our way through this is to get more homes and uh, so the employers can come here, hire the jobs, and get the people. Thank you. Thanks, John. Paul, rebuttal? No, I'm good. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next question's from Shannon. Uh, legislature gridlock has become the norm. Increasingly, the final deals on major bills are forged by the governor, House Speaker, and Senate Majority Leader with little or no input from rank and file legislature, legislators. What specific measures will you take to reduce the increasing <coughs> partisanship of the lawmaking process? Is that me, it's right? John first. Okay, th yeah, I thought it was. Uh, well, first of all, we have to create professional relationships in our uh, groups in here. Yes, these big omnibus bills are causing a lot of problems on there. And uh, I do not necessarily know how to break this up into individual budget bills on there so we could discuss each one individually. But what we need to do is to figure out a way. And the only way I can do it is to create relationships with my other members of the Senate and also of the House. Uh, a representative that was in our district uh, last time, for two years ago, said, John Peters is a person I can work with. So we got to create individual relationships. I'll have to work with the governor, and I have to know what's going on into every bill. I'm a pretty good student now, as compared to when I was in college, and I can read, I can get through stuff. I know there's, what, 10,000 pages in a bill or something like that, Paul? It's, you, you, you've seen them. You know, all I've seen is the piles on the desks. So that's what 
that what we have to do is be able to know what's in our bills as they're doing the negotiation and the fact that they come to people like Paul or if me if I'm elected the very last minute is not an acceptable way of doing things. Thanks John. Paul? You know I think uh, part of the term the legislative gridlock and some of and I have people uh, throughout the district around the state ask questions about this part of it is the way it's portrayed coming out of St. Paul um, and I'll say that some of the Twin City media that's reporting on this and it, it it must make it sound better that way yes there is political divide but and in the end some of these it was mentioned leadership making these deals with the governor a lot of times that is who we see in the end but I know even just this last year we didn't have a lot of things we got across the finish line we had things that died in process but I was heavily involved in a number of those pieces um, even uh, meeting with leadership and the governor around the table in the end that deal does go through our leader to the governor but um, there was a few of us that actually put the deal together so it does include our membership and in this case our caucus and then we've got those of us in the caucus that have uh, kind of take a leadership role on these things so there are a lot more people involved than just the final uh, couple that we see a lot of times on TV um, you know and then there's also the times I've I was in some of those final meetings where it just wasn't going so you know I closed up my laptop because it wasn't a deal I was going to take for our people and for what we were looking to do. Um, but it, uh, it, as John mentioned, at that level, it's all about relationships too. And I've always said across this whole campaign, relationships matter. And, um, and that's the part of what I've enjoyed doing. It's, it's working with people, uh, and that's part of the legislative process, uh, whether it's uh, those of us in caucus or we get together with others, it's uh, being able to work and respect people. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> John, rebuttal? No, I'd just like to say thanks for the work he's done, but I hope I can do better. All right. Next question's from Dennis. In Maine, the Carson v. Mecken Supreme Court ruled that a state could not exclude private religious schools from receiving public funding only because of their religion. Now that opens the door for public funding for private education. Are you in favor of school vouchers that allow parents to use education funding to apply to private school tuition? Why or why not? Um, I do support school vouchers. I'm also a big advocate of our uh, public school system. But we do know in our state we have some schools that are failing our students horribly. And they happen to be in um, well, they're not up in this region, they're down in the metro, and they are also the ones receiving the most money. And I'm all for doing whatever we can to make sure those young people get the education that they deserve, and we all hope they get. And in the end, I think it'll force some of those public schools to toe the line and do their job. Um, so at this point, I support the vouchers until I know differently, but uh, I would like to keep all options on the table because I believe our young people deserve it. We're going to need them to do a lot of work behind us um, as we're all uh, getting to a point where we're going to be relying on them to support us. And uh, um, so, yeah, I, I want to see them succeed. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. John? Uh, the Twin City Schools problem is more with the community and the amount of money that they have on there. So they need more support than we do out here because we have a better family structure and I'll work our way through all that. Uh, I do not support vouchers at all uh, to anybody. Uh, the public school in our area is the center of our communities. If what happens if we start taking money away, putting them in vouchers, that means we're taking money away from counselors, from health professionals, that we need in our school. Eventually that may mean that Long Prairie Browerville can't have a wrestling team. And that would probably make some people very mad down there. So, uh, and I know there's teams up here that like the same thing. So they will start taking things away. We'll make our classrooms bigger. We cannot take any money and we, away from the public schools and we gotta put more money into them than we currently are. 
Thanks, John. Paul Rebuttal? All right, we are going to move into our closing comments then. So each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks. And John, you will go first. Well, thank you. Uh, as I was talked about before, I really believe in people and the people need to be served. I believe the government can serve that. I think we need to provide more money to our townships so they can do the road so we can lower our property taxes. We need to lower, put more money into our schools from the state level so we can lower our property taxes. We need to equal things out. I believe in people. So I would really like to be your senator. I'd like, I've got a broad uh, area of expertise. Just to let you know, when I went to college, I majored, I had a scholarship in football, drama, and uh, academics. So that means that I can talk to different people all the way. And I believe that my well-rounded area of expertise could be an added value to the people, the people working in St. Paul. I'd really like to thank you. And Paul, thank you for being here tonight. I enjoy talking to you. And we plan on remaining friendly the rest of this time. Thanks, John. Paul. OK, thank you. Um, you know, I've mentioned a, a couple of these things in the uh, past number of, or 50 minutes, I guess we had. But um, you know, over the, the term that I've, or the time I've had to spend in uh, St. Paul, I'm proud of what uh, Senate Republicans have done. Um, we've worked well together. Um, it's not about what an individual can get done by ourselves. As an individual, that's all we are. It's what we do as a team. I believe that we have uh, been a good team down there, uh, working with the other members also of the Senate. Uh, it's, it takes all of us to make this thing work. Uh, if we look at what bills go through at the end, I mean, even throughout the year and at the end of the year, very, very few in their final passage are ever party line. Um, there is always uh, some going from both parties to make this thing work. Um, I'm proud to be part of that, and I feel that we've uh, done a good job over the last uh, number of years. I've enjoyed serving uh, the citizens of northern Minnesota the past six years, and I hope that uh, we can continue to work together. Uh, this district got changed up just a little bit. I'm uh, excited to uh, uh, work more to the south. Uh, we've got a good group down all the way down through the south end of Todd County. Been met a lot of nice people over the summer. And, uh, you know, with that, I realize there's a lot of serious work ahead, as we've discussed here earlier, and I look forward to rolling up my sleeves and uh, going back to work uh, next year um, if uh, everything works out. So with that, I would just encourage everyone to get out and vote. If you haven't already vote, voted, please do. Uh, November 8th is the day. I hope that uh, I have earned your support, and uh, in the end, please vote uh, Paul Etke for Senate District 5. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our candidates for joining us tonight. I want to thank the panelists for being here tonight. I want to thank you for watching. If you missed any portion of tonight's debate, or if you'd like to watch it again, it will be available on the Lakeland PBS website within 24 hours. That website is lptv.org. Also, Shannon will be writing a recap of the Senate 5 debate. It will be posted first on the Park Rapids website. I'm sorry, Park Rapids Enterprise website, www parkrapidsenterprise.com, and then it will appear later in the print edition. Also, you can find election coverage from KAXE on their website at kaxe.org. But stay with us, coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to have the State Senate District 6 debate featuring Senator Justin Eichhorn, Republican, and Steve Samuelson, DFL. Thanks for joining us, stick with us, we'll be right back. Lakeland News is member-supported content. Please consider supporting Lakeland News today.